My name is Dr. Francis B. Gross, and again I invite you to join me as I travel through the world of the dead. Several months after I completed my first study, I realized that some of my original theories were no longer valid. My optimism regarding life after death has greatly diminished. Still, there is one hope, that our body suffers little pain and that our mind will end on a thought unaffected by the fear of dying. The ritual of commemorating the dead has a history which dates back to the beginning of mankind. There is no group on earth that does not have some kind of ceremony which acknowledges the death of a loved one. Many extraordinary customs have resulted from man's realization of death. In the 14th century, people were hired to rouse the ghost. Their job was to attempt to bring the deceased back to life. This strange ritual eventually produced the practice of necrophilia. By making love to the dead, it was believed that sexual arousal would bring the spirit of life back into the body of one who recently died. This custom of the Middle Ages led to a greater understanding of the finality of death. As time passed, 
man realized that those who died would never physically return to life. Religion then introduced another concept of death. It conceived the belief that the soul or Holy Spirit travels beyond this earthly plane when the physical being ceases to exist. In some countries, as hamlets became villages and villages grew into towns, graveyards had to be modified to provide accommodations for the bodies of future generations. Carnal houses were created to house the bones of the dead who were removed from the cemetery after a certain number of years. Upon being blessed by a priest, the deceased remains were placed on display for loved ones to visit. Time is 1981. Graveyards still exist, but death has now become a multi-billion dollar industry. Today, a person can choose their style of wardrobe and in which manner they want to be secured for their eternal rest. Shopping for a casket is similar to buying a car. The more money you pay, the more lavish your coffin will appear. The fee for a normal funeral runs about $3,500. Of course, you have to pay an extra fee for the embalming process and any necessary cosmetic touch-ups. Funerals lie at the very innermost core of life's experience. It is a time of introspection where we honor and value fond memories of a person we shall never forget. A Hindu cremation presents a striking contrast to a Western burial. The banks of the Ganges River are considered the most desirable place for the ceremony. To prepare their dead for cremation, the body is bathed in oil and then with soap and nut powder, among other preparations. The Hindus believe that at death, the soul is trapped in the skull. Therefore, it is imperative that the skull explode during the burning process. Mourners of the loved one sprinkle holy water on the deceased and take purification baths during the cremation. They also shave their heads in deference to the departed. For the Hindu, death represents a liberation of the soul. Their ceremony of cremation ensures that the spirit of the departed will have the chance to be reborn once again. It's one thing to witness the cremation of the dead, but the horror of being burned alive is a truly agonizing face of death. Residents of this West German apartment building were the victims of a furnace explosion. Within seconds, their apartment became a burning inferno. Although firemen worked furiously to extinguish this out of control blaze, their efforts to save those trapped inside the building proved unsuccessful. January morning in 1979, 18 of the 20 residents that occupied this building lost their lives. Those who weren't asphyxiated by the massive amounts of toxic smoke were eventually burned alive. This particular man suffered third degree burns on his hands, legs, and face. A special preparation was applied to the burned areas of his body to promote healing and reduce infection. The An emergency tracheotomy had to be performed so that the victim could breathe. Unfortunately, even the advanced treatment administered by the burn center specialists could not keep this man alive.
When the warmth of springtime begins to melt the snow, a new setting for death is created. At any moment, a disaster can occur capable of turning a beautiful panorama of natural magnificence into an explosive wall of destruction. This white blanket of death is called an avalanche. When the snow begins to rumble down the mountain, anything in its path is instantly destroyed. Brenner Pass is located near the border of Austria and Italy. In April of 1975, this highway connecting the two countries became the scene of one of the worst avalanches in history. Before this disaster occurred, people had been warned not to use this route of passage. Road warnings had been posted and frequent radio reports of Monty's drivers of this expected danger. But people didn't want to listen, for many were on holiday and needed to return to either side of the border. As a result, many vacationers decided to challenge this prediction and subsequently lost their lives. In total, 50 people died in this avalanche. A whole section of Brenner Pass was buried under more than 14 feet of snow. Some people never made it out of their cars. Those who did had nowhere to go and froze to death while trying to escape. Hypothermia is probably one of the most painful ways to die. During this process, you literally freeze to death. The whole disaster could have been avoided if these people had only heeded the warning signs of impending danger. Boxing is perhaps the most brutal of all professional sports. Sheer strength, endurance, and agility are the major ingredients of a winner. Everyone who enters this sport dreams of one day becoming the next champion. Their desire for wealth and recognition are great motivating factors in their quest for the title. I was born poor, and uh, many nights I went to bed with an empty stomach, and uh, I read where guys like Sugar Ray Robinson, uh, Joe Lewis, and all these guys were born in very poor areas, and uh, they, uh, through sports, they got recognition, they got respect, they traveled around the world, and they got to do things that otherwise they would have never done, and, uh, but yet nothing comes easy in life. Boxing is a tough racket, it's very tough. Three minutes in the ring of actual fighting is much more difficult than two weeks of hard training. But it's the training that hardens the muscle and strengthens the fighter's endurance. Another important element of his training is the fighting strategy. He must learn how to throw a punch and how to protect himself at all times. Smart trainers would take time and teach kids the difference between coming in and going backwards, where it would take more time to teach this kind of boxing, there would be less people getting hurt in the ring. Sparring marks the final stage of training. During these sessions, a fighter will learn to take punches and to test his own offensive skills. 90% of the boys are not in the physical condition for a boxer that they should be at the time they appear for a fight. On September 19, 1980, Johnny Owens and his managers felt he was ready. The fight was a scheduled 15-round title bout for the Bantamweight Championship of the World. Owens' opponent was a reigning champion from Mexico, Lupe Pintor. 
For the first eight rounds, Johnny Owens held his own, although his battle wounds were clearly visible. Then in the eighth round, Owens went down for the first time. At the end of this round, Johnny Owens was hurting, but he was not a quitter, and even though he was bleeding from his nose and mouth, he continued to battle Pintor over the next three rounds. Johnny Owens was knocked down for the second time in the fight, he seemed totally disoriented. As a doctor, it seemed obvious to me that the fight should have been stopped, but the referee thought otherwise. Prior to this fight, Owens had never been knocked down. This time, when he hit the canvas, he would never get up. At the time, Lupe Pintor had no idea his devastating punch had sent his opponent into a coma. At 24 years old, Johnny Owens had subjected his body to such severe punishment, he would never even realize he had lost his match, for this was to be his last fight. As a doctor worked furiously to help Owens regain consciousness, the people surrounding the fallen fighter knew he was in serious trouble. The two knockdowns in the 12th round had definitely done their damage. Before finally dying, Owens would undergo two brain operations and would be connected to a life support system for almost his entire stay at the hospital. After contracting a respiratory condition during his coma, Owen succumbed to the final count. If this youngster ever decides to enter the world of professional boxing, I wonder what the future has in store. There is a breed of men who enjoy taking their machines beyond the normal use of transportation. The word impossible is not a part of their vocabulary. When the odds seem totally against them, they are the first to tell you otherwise. These people are modern-day gladiators, better known in our society as stuntmen or daredevils. The thrill of putting their lives on the line is not the key to their profession. If you talk to any of these professionals, they'll continually emphasize their own safety as foremost in any stunt they perform. But no matter how prepared they may be in their technical planning, the risk of death is still something they must consider. And yet the spectators who watch these events can never be really disappointed for they can share its success or scream at the results of failure. I have watched the crowd's reaction when a stuntman has been unsuccessful. In my mind, there is no doubt that most of them have felt a morbid fascination when viewing a human disaster. If you disagree with me, I'll prove my point. Now it's your turn to be a part of that crowd.
On August 4th, 1974, stuntman Bobby Pesco attempted unsuccessfully to jump 28 cars on his motorcycle. After hitting the last car, Pesco's body was hurled hundreds of yards on the cement roadway. Paramedics and track marshals tried frantically to save his life. Unfortunately, their efforts were in vain, for Pesco died a few hours later. As Pesco's wife held onto her unconscious husband, spectators tried to get a final glimpse of the fallen stuntman. There is no doubt it takes a certain kind of man to enter this profession. If Pesco was ever afraid of dying, at least his end came quickly. Chuck Strange realized early in his career that ramp-to-ramp -ramp acts in cars and motorcycles were becoming commonplace. In late 1975, he found a Chevy dealer willing to supply him with pickup trucks to perform his stunts. Strange had finally found a vehicle that would make his act unique. In November 1978 at the Ontario Motor Speedway, Strange attempted a ramp-to-ramp -ramp jump with his pickup truck covering a distance of 98 feet. During this jump, Strange's truck was flying at a speed of 50 miles per hour after taking off from a ramp angle 17 degrees. This jump was just a prelude to a stunt he would perform on January 13, 1978 in front of 59,000 people at the Houston Astrodome. During this jump, Strange would attempt to clear 16 cars. What made this jump dangerous was that the dome sunken arena floor was not nearly big enough for him to make a straight and level approach. Earlier in the day during his last practice jump, Strange was unaware that he had peeled back a steel shield underneath his truck. As a result, this bent steel dug into the ramp at takeoff and it caused his truck to veer to the right. It took 30 minutes to extricate Strange from the truck, but he was lucky. The impact broke one of his ribs, bruised a kidney, dislocated his elbows, shattered his forearms, and broke his nose. When doctors later examined Strange, they all agreed that it was miraculous that he had not been killed. It had been the third time in his career that he had heard this remark. You can rest assured that when his injuries finally heal, this man will be back ready to challenge death once again. In 1976, Morrisburg, Canada was the site of the greatest car stunt ever performed. This event was known as the Super Jump. Stuntman Kenny Powers would attempt the longest car jump in history. His goal was to jump the St. Lawrence River. The distance would be one mile. An eight and a half story ramp was constructed for his rocket powered Lincoln Continental. Once the car would leave this ramp, it would sail one mile over the river and land on Ogden Island in the state of New York. This jump had been in the planning for over four years. Over one million dollars had been spent and 110,000 yards of dirt had been moved to construct this special runway. Kenny Powers would be jumping three times the distance Evil Knievel had tried to achieve during his jump at Snake River Canyon. Powers' car would reach a takeoff speed of 280 miles an hour. Within seconds, he would reach an altitude of 300 feet. His body would undergo a force of over 30 Gs. Go. 
This jump had been attempted four times previously and had to be canceled. This time, Kenny Powers knew there was no turning back. Powers said his final prayers. His self-confidence was high. Any self-doubt or hesitation could cost him his life. A helicopter roamed the sky while power speedboats and divers waited on the other side of the river in case of a disaster. As the final seconds ticked away, Power's young wife became anxious. Would this be the last stunt he would ever perform? was unsuccessful. As rescuers reached the car, Powers was freeing himself from the special harness. But nobody knew the extent of his injuries. His car disintegrated in midair and landed in the river. His wife and the crowd waited anxiously for news. Powers was lucky. He had broken his back. This was nothing new, for he had so